Great, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so this talk is on some work we did on improvements to the sure paleo intensity method. Um, so if we look at the paint database, all the data in that database, um, for which there's just been a major update uh, by Bono et al. So we've got a brand new version to look at. Um, Although we can see that a lot of that data comes from the Talia method or one of its variants, um, there's a substantial amount of data uh, that comes from a number of different other uh, paleo intensity uh, methods. And of this data, the Shaw method is the most common by a considerable amount. It uh, accounts for half of this data. So it's actually an important method to understand and uh, to utilize. <clears throat> So I'll briefly run you through the how the method works. Um, it's essentially a series of uh, stepwise demagnetizations um, followed starting with uh, the NRM and then a sequence of ARMs and full TRMs are imparted and then demagnetized. And we can see that um, the ARMs are positioned in that sequence uh, before and after a TRM so that they can uh, capture any alteration that occurs and then correct for that. So in the diagram at the top, we've got uh, NRM and TRM demagnetization, uh, demagnetization spectra. And then if we plot those against each other, we get a, a rough paleo intensity uh, slope, which we can see is slightly curved. And so then if we look at the ARMs that were imparted either side of that TRM, we can, uh, at the bottom in blue, we can see that they're actually, there's a difference between those. And the slope that they produce is also curved, and this is thought to be due to the alteration that occurs in the acquisition of the TRM. So we can then uh, correct that TRM by multiplying the data points in that TRM by the data points in the ARM slope. And when we do that, uh, the result is a much more linear paleo intensity slope. And so we call our corrected TRM TRM star. This process is then repeated and we produce um, an additional TRM slope, which we call slope T. And this is the double heating part of the method, which um, we compare TRM1 with the corrected TRM2. And if those alteration corrections uh, work as they should, uh, the result is a linear unit slope. And that slope is then used as um, to validate the initial ARM corrections and uh, low temperature demagnetization is often included in this method, but it's not a requirement and it doesn't affect our results. So I've just omitted it from this description for simplicity. <clears throat> and so there are a lot of, there's, there's problems with this method, um, which stem from uh, it not being based on explicit theory, uh, such as the Talia method. And so we don't really know whether ARM and TRM are analogs of each other within a sample, or certainly if uh, they respond in the same way to alteration. And so this can lead to weaknesses in the method, particularly with the double heating part, because it's relied on quite heavily uh, and really it only provides a snapshot of what is otherwise a complicated alteration processes. So how do we really know if the estimate that we get is accurate so the work we did involved trying to quantify the accuracy and the precision of the results that are achievable using the Shaw method and to determine an optimal set of selection criteria and also to identify any uh, experimental weaknesses within the method. Um, and this uh, work was published last July in Frontiers, which is uh, open access if you want to uh, read about it there. So we took a large uh, data set of mainly non-ideal, uh, mainly Precambrian uh, samples from larvas and dikes, but also much, some much younger samples. So we've got a, a, a large mixture of samples. And these all underwent a full shore double heating technique experiment, but with varying inputs. So uh, everything from the bias fields that we used whether we use low temperature demagnetization, the whole duration to be used in the acquisition of the TRMs, or whether they were heated in uh, vacuum or air. So again, um, 
a large mixture of conditions for this experiment. And what we did is we treated the second part of the double heating technique data as an initial experiment. So the TRM1 became our NRM and the TRM2 became our TRM1. And uh, this made this then a controlled experiment where we knew what the answer should be, which is one. Uh, and that's exactly like the slope T slope I showed you earlier. So we process this data to include the full coercivity range to remove any user bias in this respect. And it's important to note that these samples were all thermally reset, but they're not thermally stable, so they were prone to further alteration. We then applied a set of base selection criteria to the, to the simulated results, uh, which we can see in this table. Uh, the first four are standard directional uh, criteria. And the bottom two are new to this method, and they are the uh, BTEL scatter parameter and F resid, which is uh, a measure of how well the paleo intensity slope trends to the origin. <clears throat> we then use this as a baseline to test for the optimal linearity parameter. And the ones we were interested in testing are the R squared correlation and the curvature parameter K prime, each with two different minima. And we used a Monte Carlo downsampling technique for this where we would randomly sample three specimens from the entire data set and then we'd repeat that 10,000 times. This produces 10,000 mean paleo intensities and standard deviations all with an N of three. We would then average those 10,000 results to determine an overall mean paleo intensity and standard deviation for an N of three and calculate their 95% confidence interval, which is two standard deviations from the mean. We would then repeat this process with increasing n. So next we would uh, randomly sample four specimens 10,000 times, then five specimens, et cetera. And this uh, allowed us to assess the accuracy in the and the standard deviation of the mean as a function of n. We then repeated this procedure um, after applying each additional linearity parameter. So we did one run of Monte Carlo downsampling with just applying the base selection criteria and then four more runs with each linearity parameter. And the results look like this. So on the top plot, we've got mean paleo intensities and the bottom plot, we've got mean standard deviations plotted against the number of samples that were downsampled. And if we look at the top plot, we can see that the mean paleo intensity is pretty much always one. And that was due to having a near normal distribution of results. However, it's the actual 95% confidence interval that's the important result here, because within that interval, um, any paleo intensity result can be produced. With, um, however, also within that interval, those re results for any given N are extremely robust because they're based off 10,000 mean paleo intensities. And we can see that um, as the selection criteria become more efficient, that 95% confidence interval starts to narrow quite a lot uh, around the true mean. And so we can look at those results uh, slightly differently. In this plot, the gray columns uh, correspond to the left y-axis and they are the number of samples that pass the selection criteria. And we can see that actually um, they're fairly similar despite very different results. And this green column, which is this NCIPI 10%, is um, it's just the number of samples required uh, for the 95% confidence interval to, to reduce to be within 10% of the true mean, which I guess is a measure of uh, what a high uh, quality paleo intensity method uh, should be able to produce. And we can see that if we take um, a K prime with a minima of 0.2, that achieves this with just six samples. And if we compare that to the currently used R squared correlation with a 0.990 minima, that requires 15 samples. So there's a, a big improvement already by using this new selection criteria. And this is the criteria that we consider to be optimal uh, due to the, uh, just the pass rate versus the accuracy of it. And it's important to note here that we've achieved these results uh, without the use of a second heating 
So this is just from an initial heating. <clears throat> so then we wanted to look at this double heating technique a little bit more. Um, and one of the things we looked at was varying the hold times in the experiments. So one experiment, we used a slightly shorter second hold duration for the, for the acquisition of the second TRM. And here on the left, we plotted these samples uh, against their slope T values, which should be one where we can see the red dashed line. And some of them are very high. And uh, so we took these samples from site MD6 on the, onto the right, and we compared those with their sister samples from that site, which underwent much longer hold durations or various hold durations. And we got this trend uh, and we can see that the longer the hold duration, the, the closer to un unity the slope T became. And so there seems to be some sort of hold time dependence for this value. We then looked at these samples uh, in a bit more detail by carrying out a third TRM for 40 minutes and um, an additional ARM as well. <clears throat> so here we're just looking at one sample. Uh, the demagnetization spectra for TRM and ARM are plotted. And then on the third panel, we've got their remnants magnitudes and their residuals. And if we just look on that third panel, we can see that the, um, the ARMs, which are in blue, um, they sort of behave fairly normally. There's a little bit of alteration to the magnitude of those. However, the TRMs in orange, we can see that when we get to TRM2, it was, it was only able to acquire almost half the magnitude of TRM1, which we can see in the demagnetization spectra also. Uh, but, um, but then when we gave it a third TRM for a longer duration, um, that it was able to acquire more remnants. So we have this TRM magnitude reversing and it's not easily explained. It also infers that alteration can occur undetected. And so we've got this reversing magnitude in TRM, but we've also observed this in ARM in other experiments. And it may not be that uncommon because um, in many published data, the two ARM slopes that are published can often be seen to be more than and less than one or vice versa, which is in this situation here where ARM1 is in blue and ARM2 is in green. And that strongly suggests that the same sort of thing is happening. And there's another sort of potential weakness with this double heating technique in that um, if you have this situation where your second ARM slope is a, a unit slope, that means that no alteration or no ARM alteration has occurred in the second heating. And it, it sort of, it may invalidate the alteration check because you need alteration to verify that the alteration corrections have worked in the initial paleo intensity part of the experiment. And so we've oh, identified. Sorry. Uh, sorry. We've identified that slope T can be influenced by hold duration. And so too, maybe then can the paleo intensity, although to a lesser extent, because the samples spend a lot less time at high temperature for that part of the experiment. However, a solution would be to vary the hold durations in the initial uh, acquisition of the TRM in sister samples. And then you could sort of uh determine the difference in the results and maybe limit the standard deviation of those and so just in summary then um we've determined that the the double heating technique results which are the slope t values don't appear to be robust but we have produced a robust measure of the accuracy and the precision of the sure method and um we've got excellent results using our new selection criteria which are, are, these are our preferred criteria. And these are a big improvement over the current method. And importantly, these results are obtained from a single heating. So there's no double heating required. And it also makes the, um, the experiment, experiment uh, much quicker. So therefore we'd recommend using these um, improved selection criteria with varied hold durations uh, for TRM1 and, and lot, a lot less reliance on the double heating technique, although we do need to uh, understand uh, a bit more about it. And that's it, thank you.